once we allow the lattice to vibrate, the electrons are going to give off energy and pick up energy from the phonons. And hence, two non-interacting electrons are going to be interacting with each other through the lattice. Right? So the electrons start uh, scattering from each other. And we consider these pair scattering events. So, So what's the, what's the wave function for an electron pair? We know that two electrons can be in a singlet or triplet state. So let's consider the spin singlet state. Okay. Spin singlet. The spin singlet state is characterized by an anti-symmetric uh, spin part and a symmetric uh, spatial part. And that, that symmetric spatial part is what allows you to save energy. So, well, without, without showing you why, I'm going to say that uh, we know, based on this kind of thinking, that the spin singlet uh, has a uh, symmetric spatial uh, uh, wave function, so it's going to save more energy, just qualitatively. So, spatially, symmetric. Okay. So, uh, the spatial wave function is then, I can have K1 for electron 1, K2 for electron 2, that's 1, added to K2 for electron 1, K1 for electron 2. Right? So now if I assemble the wave function from plane wave states, then basically it's going to look like uh, something like 1 over square root of omega, 1 over square root 2 e to the i uh, k1 dot r1 e to the i k2 dot r2 plus e to the i k1 dot r2 e to the i k2 dot r1 it's going to be something like this. And we can, uh, so now uh, I'm not just going to consider one of these because the other one is, is actually gives uh, the exactly the same kind of contribution. Okay. So I'm going to consider a term like this. Okay. And to describe this, I'm going to move to, uh, I'm going to move to the uh, center of mass frame. Center of mass frame. So in the center of mass frame, we find the, the position for the center of mass between two identical electrons. And this is, of course, R1 plus R2, or R1 half. And then the relative position is R1 minus R2. Okay. And then the center of mass momentum, this is equal to just K1 plus K2. And then the relative momentum, small k, this is equal to 1 half k1 minus k2. And this 1 half can <coughs> come from the uh, reduced mass being half of mass. Uh, of we can have two identical parts. But I'm not going to go into detail about, about, the, uh, about that. So uh, you find out that this, this whatever is here in the exponent, okay, this turns into uh, e to the i big R dot big K e to the I small r small k, which is kind of what we expect, right? The center of mass moving with this K, and then the, the relative, um, in relative coordinates, the relative, uh, the reduced mass moving with this small k. So that's, that's what's happened. So we consider this, these kind of states. So these kind of states can be characterized by a center of mass momentum and a relative momentum. Right? So we write the two electron states using these two momentum, and they will look like k, small k, right? Okay. Right. Right. So if we consider different uh, uh, states with different k1, k2, then these will be like k prime, small k prime. Right? Now let's consider the scattering of, uh, of these pair states. So we have in the in this uh, component representation for k1 and k2, we have an electron with k1 coming in 
and the um, electron was K2 coming in. Okay. The scattering, they're going to exchange a phonon, okay. uh, wave, wave number Q. Okay. And then what comes out is K1, uh, K1 minus Q. Okay. And uh, K1 plus Q. So now in this in this representation, this kind of process looks like okay, we have a state. Okay, we have a state with uh, big K and small K coming in. Okay. And then something internal happens, which I will denote by uh, a phonon is uh, emitted and absorbed internally. Okay. And what comes out is the, the, the central mass hasn't changed, and the central mass momentum doesn't change. Uh, what changes is this? K plus Q. Right? Okay. So now, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because the special way that we chose to define the only in 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 this representation, what should be conserved is the central mass momentum, not the relative momentum. Right? Okay. okay. So uh, now, if I look at this on the Fermi sphere. Here. Uh, and I, I'm going to draw. A, I'm going to attempt to draw some some nice picture here. Okay, so we roughly have a sphere here. And if I have, and we know that the sphere is going to be the edge of the sphere is uncertain, right? So it's going to be plus minus uh, uh, the energy of the highest, the most energetic phonon. So the sphere I, I'm going to denote by having like three layers. And then on the outside, okay, so it roughly looks like this. So now if I have, if I started with a state that has a total momentum like this, then I'm only looking at maybe the YZ plane, which is a sphere. So this can be composed of um, two states like this. Okay. Now after the scattering event, their relative momentum is going to change. And this must be, this must be the same. Okay. So now, uh, let's be imaginative and find out what are the possible, uh, what are the possible uh, states after the scattering that this state can go to. So now, these are complete. This is just simple geometry. These are completely uh, symmetric now. But if I were thinking about maybe say over here, on the in inside of the uh, on the inside of the Fermi sphere, yeah. then the other one needs to be longer okay, instead of the here. Okay. So if I trace out what are the possible uh, states that this is linked to through this kind of scattering. I'm going to draw out a diagram that roughly looks like uh, okay. so here is possible and then correspondingly And because we're on a sphere, okay, you, you rotate this thing you know, uh, about the y-axis, and you find that a whole ring is possible on the surface of the Fermi sphere. Okay. So if I draw this in 3D, it will look like a band over here. Right? This band is possible. And this is determined by the magnitude of this. So the larger this is, the higher is over here, and the, the smaller the area. Meaning that the larger k is the less value there are. Okay, it's going to link. Okay, the last number of states is going to link. Now, what's the extreme case here? What if the total k is zero? If the total k is zero, then the whole sphere is linked. Right? In the total k equals the zero case, okay, we basically have the entire Fermi sphere being linked by this scattering, this kind of scattering. Okay. So I'm going to draw uh, 
suppose I started with, since k is zero, you know, these things must be opposite each other. Right? I started with k1 and k2 like this. And then I could go to any of these states. Okay. And the phonon emitted will look like you know, this, this one, q is something like this. And then the, uh, this one gets picked up over here. The, the opposite direction, right? So q is like this. Now you, now you ask me, well, is, is this q long enough for the, uh, for the phonon? Because we, we saw later, previously, uh, the magnitude of this q, the, 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 the highest possible q, is on the order of the radius. Right? So, so even at zero k is not the entire Fermi sphere is thing. Yeah. Yeah. Roughly speaking. Because for that to happen, you would need like q to be twice as much as the, uh, as the uh, Fermi uh, momentum right? to be able to link the whole sphere. Okay. So now, by thinking about this, by thinking about the density of states available after the scattering, we can say that the, the scattering event is going to be dominated by these uh, states, by the two electrons whose center mass momentum is zero. Okay. So we're going to be considering states with states with zero and some k to start with. After the scattering, it goes to zero k plus q. Okay, that's the idea. So now you uh, now now you might wonder. Well, if superconductivity is caused by these kind of electron pairs whose total momentum is zero, how can there be any conductivity? Right? Since on, on average these two electrons are go are not going anywhere, how is charge carried? Well, we can do a calculation. Which is to say, well, if I want for a normal metal, right, ten, n equals to 10 to the 22 okay, per cubic centimeter, and if I want uh, a uh, a current density j that's about 10 to the 8 uh, amperes per centimeter squared, which is uh, an extremely large number, right? if I want this, we can we can calculate how much if the whole Fermi sphere is involved. Then how much we, uh, how much of the k do we need for all the states? Okay. You find that this k is, is about uh, an order of 20, 20 orders of magnitude smaller than the uh, Fermi uh, the Fermi momentum. So what it tells you is that although we have a picture where everything is linked through these zero total k states, uh, zero uh, center of mass k states, okay, to get a conduction is still possible because to, to, to even to get such a high current density, okay, you only need this to be you know, about 10 to the minus. This is, you find that that big K is on the order of 10 to the minus 8 uh, inverse centimeters. Okay. So it's an extremely small number and we can just take it to be zero. This picture is fine. Even when they're all linked through this almost zero uh, center mass momentum state, uh, they can still have some conduction just because of the sheer number of electrons involved. Okay. So that's, that's the idea here. Okay. So let's, let's uh, summarize what we need to do in terms of thinking about the Cooper instability, how these electrons are, are, are linked together. So we need to look for a possible phonon mediated interaction that links electrons in, in, opposite, in states of opposite momentum and opposite spin. And we, we try to find a energy, a, a bound state <coughs> that's, that has an energy lower than the Fermi energy. And that's what we're looking here. So now, we move on to the next part, which is this uh, simple harmonic oscillator coupling. So the simple harmonic oscillator coupling tells you that, suppose now I have some kind of, I have, I have two systems, system one, Link through a harmonic oscillator. Okay. System two of this harmonic oscillator have m, omega dot are the relevant parameters. And when, when two systems otherwise not interacting is linked through this, and maybe they're linked through some kind of a linear linear process, where we find, we say that the interaction okay, between 
these two systems and the harmonic oscillator is also formed okay, by this, some kind of a complex oscillator, which is okay, x1 plus x2, where this x1 and x2 are respectively some dynamical variable in the two systems. Okay, and then the the, uh, the oscillator I will use uh, <coughs> x. Okay. So if we have this kind of uh, a link, then uh, we know that for the oscillator, we know that what's the Green's function. Right? Uh, the Green's function says the, the response of the oscillator coordinate, just think about 210, is going to be from 0 to t. And of course, you need this coupling constant. Uh, no, no. Okay. The force applied uh, convolved with uh, the green function. The green function is called G. G of, I don't know, sorry. It's the G of T minus tau, F of tau. Okay. This kind of a convolution process gives you the response of the, uh, of the uh, harmonic oscillator. Right? And what is the force uh, in this scenario? Okay. To get the force, we take the the partial derivative with respect to the variable. So the force is equal to minus dv dx for any of these three systems. If I want the force on x1, I just take the, uh, take the derivative with respect to x1. Right? So the force for the oscillator is equal to g x1, which is a dynamical variable system of the t, plus x2. So we get that this is equal to 0 t. What's the Green's function for a simple harmonic oscillator? It's a sinusoidal one. That's, the, that's like the impulse response, right? If I push, if I plug the, the oscillator at some time, it's going to, uh, it's going to oscillate sinusoidal. So we know that since the impulse response is this, the green function must be this. Right? And then uh, g, okay, x1 of t plus x2 of t. Sorry, we have a tau. All right, okay. So now from here, I can think, uh, I can find out what is the, uh, what is the force on system one? Okay. I plug this into here, okay. and then take the <coughs> derivative with respect to x one. I get that the force on system one is a function of t. Okay. Get scaled by g again. So this is like g squared. Okay, zero t one over m omega naught sine omega naught. Correct. Okay. So you find what's interesting is, well, this the motion of the this thing has a uh, has an effect on itself at some time later, and this is precisely what we we what we expect because because think about this the harmonic oscillator remembers. How how the state uh, what the state was in system one at some previous time, and that that state is going to come back and influence it at some other time. So harmonic oscillator has a memory, and this memory gives rise to a retarded interaction, just like two when you have two charges linked by the electromagnetic force, which you have seen these are a bunch of harmonic oscillators. When they start to affect each other, we have a retarded interaction. Because they, they are they are not directly coupled to each other. You can think about them as being coupled to the field, and then coupled to each other, uh, mediated by the field. Right. So whenever you have this kind of thing, this, this, you are going to have a retarded interaction. So there's a self energy involved. So if I say now I take away the effect of the harmonic oscillator, I blindly take this to be the force on on the uh, on system one. And I find out what's the effective interaction between system one and two. Okay, and that you can find by taking the force to be the derivative 
of uh, some potential, effective potential with x1, right? Okay. So we find that the effective potential, which is a term in the Hamiltonian between the systems 1 and 2, this is equal to uh, g squared 0 t. Convolutions in uh, in the uh, uh, time domain. We can think about uh, what is the uh, product in the uh, Fourier domain. Right? So it pays to look at the pro the, the Fourier transform of this thing. Okay. The Fourier transform of this thing is going to give you what is the component of the interaction when the frequency exchange between the two systems is omega. Okay. That's what the Fourier transform means. So the Fourier transform of this as a function of omega, I'd like to try to tell that here. Okay. What's the Fourier transform of the side? Uh, I'm going to write down these functions first. Okay. One over omega squared minus omega dot squared, something like that, right? Yeah. Wait. It depends on whether you're taking Laplace or Fourier transform. No, we're taking Fourier transform. Okay, so, so, so. so just, uh, just one. Yeah. So now you see, depending on the sign, depending on whether omega is larger or smaller than omega naught, the omega naught being the uh, the natural frequency of the oscillator. We can have an effective positive or negative effective interaction, which is saying attractive or repulsive. So there is a possibility for a attractive interaction when, we, when two things are coupled to the uh, to the uh, oscillator, and this is what happens for the for the uh, two electrons. And so now, if we went ahead and quantize the whole problem by replacing x1 and x2 with the uh, electron coordinates. And replacing x by quantizing x into the phonon, right, we get uh, essentially what we want. But that quantization procedure is is going to be very tedious. <coughs> Let me just give you the uh, sketch the beginning of what we would do. Okay. So let's consider the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian for electron. And I'm going to show you that this Hamiltonian looks something of that form. So it's describing exactly when uh, like two electrons, they are coupled to the lattice, which are harmonic operators. Okay. So uh, at, now, actually, even this electron phonon interaction, if we do it from first principle, it is too difficult. So I'm going to show you. Uh, this is taken from Haken's book. Haken. Uh, and the, uh, this book, uh, I'll, I'll send you the, uh, the reference later. Okay. So in, the, in this book, Haken makes an analogy between the electron phonon interaction to that of a massive particle coupled to a massless string. Okay. 
Okay. So we have the gravitation and we have a massive particle that's described by a wave function. And for a moment, let's think about the mass actually being distributed according to the wave function. Okay. So we have some massive particle, and this is in 1D. Okay. And then we have a massless string. And you are by now familiar with what the Hamiltonian for a string is, whether in the classical case or the complex case. Okay. So I'm just going to talk about the coupling between them. Okay. So we are considering okay, some string fixed on both ends and a uh, wave function of the particle that might look something like this. The wave function looks like this. So the mass is being distributed here and it is coupled to the string. Right? So the string is holding the mass here. So because of this coupling, and because of the, the gravitational field that acts on this particle, okay, there's some kind of a potential energy, depending on how the string, uh, how the mass, the wave function of the mass displaces the string. Okay? And that is coupled to the potential energy for the string itself. And this is how the two are coupling. Right? So the coupling term we can write down as phi g being uh, basically mg for the mass. From 0 to L, the length of the string, and integral over Q of X. And I use Q here to denote the coordinate of the string, and which is essentially the uh, this coordinate. Okay. The coordinate of the string, and then this is uh, times the, the local mass density that's present to the, uh, that's, that's uh, seen at, at each point on the string. This is going to be phi conjugate of x prime x to x, right? Okay. And other than this kind of, other than this interaction, the only way <coughs> the particles be free otherwise. Okay. So now we go ahead and do a second quantization on this interaction, on this Hamiltonian. second quantize the whole thing, we're going to write the total of Hamiltonian is equal to, well first of all there is the kinetic energy of the uh, of the electron. Right? And because it's free, we can write down a summation over a different k states, okay? and each of them having uh, h bar squared p squared over 2m, which is the uh, kinetic energy of a free particle. Okay? And then we use the uh, operator B to denote the creation operator for the for the particle. B dagger K. This okay, that's for the particle. And then for the string, we know of course. Again, I'm going to use Q to denote the wave number, which is not to be confused with this. Maybe I should use Q over here. I maybe mean, should use Y here. Yeah, Y here. So I use Q here to denote the wave number for the for the uh, uh, phonon on the string. Okay. Then this is h bar omega Q, a omega Q. Okay. So that's the the, the, the free part. Okay. And then we write the, we quantize the interaction part. Okay. So this y is going to be a summation of of uh, a and a dagger, right? Okay. What about these things? These will each be uh, replaced by the wave function operator, which is uh, so psi. The wave function operator is equal to square, uh, summation over the different uh, k states, the annihilation operator, and then you uh, you attach whatever k to be the uh, to be the. So for this one, we use. 1 over the square root of L, okay. 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 just a plane wave state. Okay. So now, if I plug this, uh, and this side dagger is, of, of course, the region con uh, of that one. If I plug everything into here, do this integral, okay, which is going to give me some kind of a quantum delta function. So if I did that integral, then I find two states, two terms, which is quite intuitive. Okay. So we have a term. Uh, the interaction part is composed of 
some coupling constant I'm just going to call G. Okay, and it's mentioned over uh, K and Q. And then one of the terms is going to be um, this one. And the other term is going to be sum on k and So this one is a particle absorbing a uh, phonon of wave vector q, right? This term, that's what it describes. What about this one? We create a phonon of q, destroy a particle of k, and then create a particle of k minus. This one describes the process of a particle emitting a phonon. Okay? So that, that's basically what you expect, right? And it actually comes out uh, directly from standard quantization if we did the carry out the algebra, which we don't have time to do right now. So now that the Hamiltonian is complete, we have the free Hamiltonian and the possibility to exchange a phonon between the uh, between the particle and the uh, and the string. And this is this essentially has the same form as the electron phonon in fraction Hamiltonian, which which and, and the, the the difference here, of course, that's in three D, and then these G, these coupling factors are going to be dependent on dependent on material parameters. Which doesn't doesn't really uh, matter um, for the, this kind of a, a sketch of the differentiability that we want to do. Yeah. So now, uh, having derived this, let's think about what if now two particles are coupled to this. Then we just write down another particle, free energy, uh, kinetic energy, and another coupling term such as this. Right? So now I can group some terms, and I find a term like this, right? where you have you have the density operator, the, these products, okay? and uh, for for one particle and the products for another particle being x one and x two, and then x is just uh, a, 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 a q or a dagger q for the harmonic oscillator. Right? So we have cast that kind of a problem into this form. And we know that there is a possibility to get a attractive interaction based on the, the energy exchange between the uh, the two electrons and the natural frequency of the phonon. Okay. So one can start by, by start from here and derive what I'm about to say um, quantum mechanically, but that's going to take you maybe two hours or so. So uh, let's not do that. If you're interested, you may do that in your final project. So now let's Is this what, what they call a Froelich? Oh, yeah, this is a Froelich. Uh, okay. Froelich. Okay. And when we do the whole calculation, and we take out the lattice part, you know, that's called the bardini pines interaction. So that, and that's a contribution from John Bardini. Okay. So now, we're off to shears, okay? And uh, actually, in my notes, which I will send out later, I use a semi classical uh, theory from uh, dielectric functions to derive the Bardeen Pines Hamiltonian uh, interaction term for you, which is considerably easier than going through this. Uh, going through this. And you can take a look at that. So now let's look at the, the most important problem of this Cooper instability. And I'll show you how the superconducting state is formed. So now, 
looking at this picture here, we see that the moment we allow scattering of electron pairs, then the pair wave function are not going to uh, not going to be energy eigenstates anymore of the new right? Because what we've seen the whole semester is a general idea is that once you have some kind of uh, perturbation, then you have a mixing of the eigenstates, right? It's with new eigenstates. So starting from this this point, we uh, we know that the uh, uh, the eigenstate for electron pair is going to be a summation of the free two electron uh, plane wave state. Right? So it's going to be a summation over k uh, of some some factor c k okay, of these um, k minus. So essentially, what we've talked about so far is all here. So we know that we know why we need to sum over these opposite momentum uh, uh, electron pairs because of what we said over here. Because that's the most possible way to link the whole Fermi sphere, and that's the most dominant scattering term. Okay. And then uh, this summation over k. Okay, what should be the limit of this summation? It should be what we talked about before, right? Thinking about we're basically summing over states within this shell. Okay, and that shell has a, a spread of momentum delta k of about uh, 10, 10 numerous microns, right? Okay. And then uh, this ck here, notice that I didn't put a vector here, and this is because since we're considering the Fermi sphere, we're not considering band structure. So this thing is like isotropic. It only depends on k. Which actually means it only depends on the energy. Okay. So now, the instability, Cooper instability problem is to say that when the Hamiltonian, which consists of the free, the free, uh, the, the uh, energy, free kinetic energy of the electron pair, and that interaction energy that we talk, 